So, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take a seat, we're going to be starting shortly.
uh, with special guests. The last one we did with uh, Martina Lika, um, where material from the broadcast archives are taken out, presented, uh, commented, deconstructed, reconstructed, and um, we've had, I guess, our official last recluminations of the year a couple of weeks ago, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to do some, some more of them, even though if it's not the centennial uh, year anymore. Um, I'd also like to give a quick uh, thank you to, uh, to Andrea Bergner. Um, Andrea works together with, uh, with Sarah on uh, programming here in the, in the McLuhan Salon. She, uh, was also the main person helping to organize uh, this event together with Anya Meyer, who's behind the camera over there. Unfortunately, Andrea um, had an injury, and so she can't, uh, she can't be here uh, this evening. Um, also, a very big uh, thank you for all the other McLuhan events that we were doing uh, this year to Katharina Fischner over here, cultural attaché from, from the embassy, because this is, this is kind of our last our last real McLuhan event here uh, this, this year. This year, this yeah. year, this year. So um, I just want to really give you guys also from the embassy a big thank you and also to Stefan Charbonneau, um, who's the, not the attaché, but the counselor for cultural um, affairs. Um, he was also primarily responsible in, uh, in, in, uh, um, in, in getting funding together so that we could invite Graham Mark in here. So, Graham, again, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and uh, we're very much looking forward to um, seeing what you've been up to the past few months. Welcome. Microphone, please. Let's see if this works. Yeah. So, lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, deep thanks. Uh, really need to go out to Stephen uh, Kovats. Uh, you named all the other names, so I won't uh, rethink Andrea Bogner and everyone else who's been so so helpful. But uh, really, uh, uh, hats off uh, to you, Stephen, for your your persistence and your kindness and, and, and just your effectiveness in making all 30 of these events and not forgetting me in, in the mix. Uh, I'm really, uh, really grateful for that. I know it's, uh, just a Herculean uh, amount of effort for you, and, and uh, such a pleasure for me. So thank you. Um, so the McLuhan archive. You said I was interested in the in the documents as opposed to the audiovisual stuff. Well, for me, it's sort of all one. Uh, and really, one of the things I'm trying to do with my with the limited time and limited PowerPointing abilities is give you a sense of the real range of material evidence in the form, much of it paper-based, much of it based in this uh, gigantic archive, the Library and Archives Canada, which has an estimated 800,000 pieces of sheets of paper uh, relating to McLuhan. Uh, and many of them, you know, sort of photocopies or articles or whatever, but a lot of original stuff and manuscripts and typescripts, and, and I'm going to try to give you a flavor of some of the more, of the, of the variety and, and depth of that material. Um, but I think I'll begin just by saying why I'm doing what I'm doing uh, with McLuhan. And it really has largely to do with my feeling that we tend to see McLuhan above all, I think, as uh, we, we tend to put him in certain boxes. And we see him. Uh, and, and rightly so. I mean, he really was a kind of initiator of discourses, to use Foucault's uh, phrase that he said about Marx and, and, and Freud. But, uh, you know, he really kind of invented, uh, to, to, to an amazing extent, uh, cultural studies with the Mechanical Bride, the 1951 book, along with a few others. But that was really a big deal, especially in the English-speaking world. I mean, we didn't know in the English-speaking world about, uh, you know, uh, Krakow or, or Benjamin or, or any of the people who were sort of doing what, what could you know, become cultural studies. Those, those translations didn't happen until later, but it was early, you know, in the English speaking world, it was really, you know, there were sort of people here and there. I mean, there was Robert Warshaw or there was Gilbert Saldes or whatever, but it was really McLuhan who, who kind of wrote a book on it and brought it together with this, uh, in, in, with the book published in 1951. Uh, so 
as with cultural studies, he also, of course, is a hugely foundational figure for communications studies as well. Uh, and uh, so, and, and, and in a way, probably to the greatest extent, he has been studied as a theorist in communication studies, and that's a, a discipline that's, I guess it's a discipline, that's alive and well, uh, an interdisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing that's branching off into, into uh, you know, media ecology and all kinds of things. And my feeling is that this McLuhan that I'm saying has been sort of taken care of uh, and really attended to by scholars is the theorist. Uh, and, and I think that it's ironic how little has been done on the material aspects of his practice, given the fact that he felt the medium is the message. And given the fact that he said, I have percepts, not concepts, uh, and, and said that his, you know, correctly in a way, that his probes and explorations didn't really add up to anything as rigorous as a theory. And so what I'm trying to do is sort of get with the program a little bit after a hundred years and do and, and apply some of his own methods to his own work. That is, to look at the media environment that he was embedded in and, and all the traces of his own, what I call his media practice. And by that, I mean not only his productions, but also his receptions, and, and, and you'll see what I mean by that. But basically, every uh, we're lucky that the archive is so rich. I mean, it looks like he just threw nothing away, so we basically have every piece of paper that passed through his hands and then some. Uh, and a lot of traces of his encounters with other media, radio, film, TV, and so on. So that's really what I'm going to be unpacking for you. But as a way in, what I'm going to do is just start the slideshow here and uh, maybe try to navigate the space in a way that allows you to look at the, at the images and at me and give you a little bit of the story of how I got, came to McLuhan. Because my day job, up until very recently, was a curator of painting, sculpture, and decorative art, so basically European and American sculpture with uh, art at the National Gallery of Canada. I was trained as an art historian, uh, and really actually a historian in, in, in print. And I'm going to go back now to a conference that I co-hosted in 1998 at Harvard University when I was a student there, uh, doing my doctoral studies, called Printing Matters, the Materiality of Print in Early Modern Europe. And this was a opportunity to bring together historians of the printed word, really literary historians who are sort of leaning that way towards a kind of materialistic take on things and seeing how meaning is embedded in particular modes of production, and historians of the printed image, which I to be, and, and, and Lisa Pond, the other, the other organizer. And we published that in 2001 in the journal Word and Image, and, uh, and I did mention, let's skip that, the name of McClure as someone who was really a precursor to uh, to you know important in, in this in this whole field, so that's available. Uh, there's a postscript by uh, Roger Chartier uh, who was kind enough to write for that, and that's in this this journal an image. If you want to go there, and I'm not even going to try to summarize the other publications by other people that have happened in the meantime. I mean, at the time when we did that in the '90s, it was a very exciting time for book history. Uh, books like Adrian Johns' Nature of the Book. Uh, there was uh, D.F. McKenzie, who was a great uh, book historian. And we were all at the time into kind of the instability of print 
And so that was a particular moment. But now I think we're in a moment where we are seeing a lot of attention to things. And I take almost as a, just a sort of a fun and fairly indicative example, uh, sort of light and, and, and delightful book called Taking Things Seriously, which is just a book published by Princeton University Press that just shows little things from people's personal collections that are opposed to, you know, you know on, the, on the left hand page, there's a little text by that person saying what this thing means to them. And so there's a bit of this going around. Obviously that's just an example. And then after the conference I ended up writing a uh, doctoral dissertation on the, in this case, largely based on these 18th century print albums that became the basis for the first catalogue as a name. And it was a catalog of the of the oeuvre of Jacques Callot, of the great 17th century printmaker. And it was very, you can see, I've got my see I've got my hand in a lot of these photographs. So I had my hand in 2003 on the on, on the on, even then uh, on the book. Not just as a gimmick, but really as a sense to give you a sense of the scale of this thing and of the function of the thing, and perhaps some indication that I'm not afraid to touch it. You know, and I think that too often uh, when we look at media such as a printed book or a printed image, things kind of get posterized, and you lose a sense of the, of the sort of the texture and the, and, and the you know, full tactility uh, and sort of intersensory uh, fullness of, of these objects. And so, let's see a lot of my hand and the images to follow. <laughs> there you go. McClure doesn't appear in the bibliography. He would have been right in here of my dissertation, but I think he's in there. So in, in, in some other ways. And there's an example of these, of these print albums that, 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 that people were compiling at the time, and McClure himself wrote a doctoral dissertation on a 16th century compiler uh, named Nash, and uh, so it's kind of I, I come in away from where he, pretty close to where he comes from, and I'm even into having quotations as he is as well. I use a lot of those, and I'm not afraid to to use sponsors have a kind of collage of of, of uh, text as well as of images. So. As I say, I was living in Ottawa, and uh, pretty much down the street from where I worked at the National Gallery uh, was the Library and Archives of Canada. And I was very excited about the possibility of doing something for the centenary of McClure, and what I really wanted to do was to have an exhibition somewhere, ideally at LAC, Library and Archives of Canada, that would bring together well, I had this idea that I put together a hundred objects and called it McLuhan Century, and there would be a kind of a very thick description, a reading of each of these objects that shows how it exemplifies his engagements with various kinds of media. And here we have there's a detail of the web page. You can go on to the LIC web page. You can get a, many hundreds of pages of a finding aid to the collection. Uh, and you can see here summarized just what's in it, 43.6 meters of textual records. So that, this is over the 800,000 papers. So that's, that's shelf meters, as you know. Uh, and various other stuff, including audio cassettes and audio discs and reels and films. And some of these things are just stuff, it's just the stuff he had. So it might not be directly him, right? It's not necessarily all of him, uh, just as all the papers aren't necessarily things written by him. Uh, but it's all stuff that was, from him and acquired and cataloged in the mid 80s uh, once it was uh, acquired. And there wasn't a lot of interest from, from, from Library and Archives Canada. Well, there's, there really wasn't interest from them. And so then I, I kept coming back to them and I, and I came with my buddy, um, Dominique Chef of Dunon, who was uh, in Toronto and did a wonderful McLuhan Festival that was really, uh, along with Berlin, just the biggest uh, sort of McLuhan celebration this year for the centenary. 
and we tried to, to you know, get something going with them in the Science and Tech Museum. Again, about McLuhan's, that the, the would be an exhibition of McLuhan's engagements with media. I uh, bumped into Robert Bean, and told a photographer, and told him about the archive, and he, he really ran with it, and has done it in a number of exhibitions. Now we're actually looking, we're getting into the library now, for the moment here, to the photographs taken by Robert Bean uh, when he went there with me over a year ago. I think it was in around May of 2010 to get in there. So now we're in there. Now we're in the reserve room. Uh, so we're getting closer uh, to the uh, to the material. And there we are, here I am. Uh, and there are the boxes of, from the McLuhan Archive, which some of you may, we have a show of hands. Has anyone actually studied, been in the McLuhan Archive? I mean, it's not a, yeah, that's what I figured. I mean, in Canada, it's a rarity, even among you know, there's many McLuhan scholars who, who, who haven't been in there. So that's good. I mean, this will be fresh for you. Uh, and, and here you can see I'm, I'm looking at a, um, a scrapbook that was assembled in the 60s by, by McLuhan, and I, and I suspect Corinne, his, his wife, who did a lot of uh, all the typing for him. And there I am, just sort of, like I say, not afraid to touch these things. Now, there's an exhibition hall, and I, and I went to LAC, and if you go past Glenn Gould's piano, which is a bit sad because it's sort of a really funny quilted thing, and, and then, then you get to this area here, which is this exhibition room, and uh, there was an exhibition on there. When I, when I remember when I went with Dominique, uh, it was on Gabriel Roy, this Canadian author, and uh, we said, well, can, you know, can we have it for 2011 and, and, and do a McLuhan thing? They said, no, 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 we're done. We're, we're not having any more, <laughs> more exhibitions. We're, we're going digital now. So uh, that's what it looks like now. It's just sort of nothing going on anymore. <clears throat> and, uh, and they've actually had, they've cut 40 positions in the last, uh, last few, last three years, just as we have the National Gallery, including my own. Uh, and so it's a pretty rough time. And, and it's a major library. I mean, the, the, most of the lists I could find on the web had is you know, fourth biggest in the world. Uh, that's the library, not the this list, but I'm sure it is an archive as well. It's substantial, and, and and yet it's a bit sepulchral in there these days. It's a bit, it's a bit uh, of a tomb. So that's the background, and what I was able to do uh, in a little of an exhibition is the talk you're about to see, the study you're about to see, which is really the first time. I'm coming out in public with my exposition on McLuhan's engagements with media. And the way I've set it up is thematically, and these themes are also pretty much chronological as well. That is, they reflect whatever stage of McLuhan's practice that he's at. And like all of us, uh, well, maybe we, you know, we're talking before we watch TV, I think. So we'll start with orality. Now, orality, as you know, is something that was of great interest to McLuhan. Uh, and he really, you know, he looked at speech as a technology. He looked at writing as a technology. I mean, he always had this big picture. Uh, and in the studies in orality, of which there were many amazing ones in the 20th century, uh, his favorite, and, and still my favorite, I think, is Eric Havelock's 1963 Preface to Plato, which is an incredible book that talks about the rise of literacy uh, and uh, what it meant for, for Greek culture uh, and, and what it meant for the, sort of the oral culture and how it was a real game changer. Uh, and then I'm also showing you a book by McLuhan's disciple pupil, it turns 100 next year, by the way, and there's going to be some celebrations in St. Louis named Walter Long. Uh, and he wrote a book, sadly published two years after McLuhan's death, so this was published in 1982, called Orality and Literacy, which is really the best introduction to that subject. It's a beautiful synopsis that coins the term secondary orality to talk about what happens when you're literate, but you're still experiencing various oral, uh, you know, 
well, situations. And, uh, and so it's a kind of overlay. And it's very good. I mean, it's a, it's a reminder that it's not like one thing just transplants another or you know, fully succeeds another. Things get hybrid, as, as, as McLuhan would say. And now we're going to go back to the first object uh, I'm going to show you from the archive. And what it is, is evidence of McLuhan's pre-literate phase. And it's a letter from his grandma uh, that is just on this scrap of paper. There's one side and there's the other side. And it says, Dear Marshall, so we're now, he was born in 1911, so we're maybe 1916, something like that. And we can pinpoint it a little bit, as you'll see. Dear Marshall, so far away, uh, I would like, sorry, it's harder to read off here. I would like to see you so much, but you are so far away. I hope to see you all sometime in warm weather. We are having very cold, much colder weather here than last winter. And I'm glad you are trying to study, keep at it. And you can soon learn to read and write. Then I know you will write me a letter with your own dear hand. So, so Marshall doesn't know how to write yet. Read or write yet. And, and this is a scribbling, almost certainly by the young Marshall, on a, the back of a mimeograph that is dated from 1915, which is a great special interest to me because McLuhan became a real power user of mimeographs uh, by, the, by circa 1950-51. Uh, he was really into uh, you know, self-publishing. Um, and, and in fact, things that were kind of proto blogs in 1951, and the mimeograph was, was the way to do that. So now we'll get to his literacy. And I want to emphasize the reception as much as production of this media environment. Um, and so here's a Valentine to Marshall from a, a secret admirer that he doubtless received at a very young age. And here is Marshall practicing his cursive. So you can see Marshall at the top, and then various writing exercises. And this is, the, is this a check mark of the teacher to show that it's been, uh, it's been properly surveyed by the teacher. And then just as a kind of example, because I'm not going to, I don't need to you know, convince you that he knew how to read and write. But I just want to uh, give you a taste of, of, of the archive by showing you this collection of cigar bands that were in a little book by, uh, that the National <coughs> owned. And I like it on many levels, but not least because it really shows text and image together. So it's sort of my thing, I guess, in some way. And it shows you know, the inseparability of these things. Uh, and it shows that print is often image as well as text, or image mixed in with text. It's complicated. Something went wrong with this slide. Uh, it's supposed to say listen, listening and watching. And so here we get to radio. And, I'm, and if I can go up here, what I'm going to do is play you an audio clip, which is from 1980. And it's Morris's, sorry. Marshall's younger brother, Maurice McLuhan, talking about the very young Marshall and his crystal radio. So let's see if this works. Here we go. My recollection uh, as we grew up as boys together was that Marshall had a keen interest in everything that was going on. Uh, was it radio that was breaking at that time? Then he was the one who, who built a, a little crystal set. And uh, we would go to sleep as kids in the same bed. We didn't have separate rooms at that time. And we would divide the, the receivers. And uh, we'd find a very good point in the crystal or a program and we fall asleep with the, on the receiver on the pillow and our ear against it. So that's more he said, very much like Marshall. He's a spitting image of, of, of Marshall's voice. 
describing how they, I guess, would split up the headphones and each take an ear on this uh, very you know, primitive built-it-yourself radio that they had, maybe circa 1920. Uh, and now I'm just going to give you a, a quotation that's in, the, in his letters, where he says, and now he's writing to his mother in 1935, and this is a random quotation, it's just the kind of thing he says to his mother about what he's doing. Uh, and he says, I have Bowen's radio, that was his, his main pal he was hanging out with in 1935 when he was uh, starting his graduate studies at, at Cambridge. He says, I have Bowen's radio, and hear many good things. Philip Snowden on Keir Hardy on Friday, Desmond McCarthy on Samuel Butler Thursday, etc. And we know who these people are. We know that Philip Snowden was a great orator himself, and, and he was the first uh, chancellor of the Exchequer, basically finance minister in, in, in England. James Keir Hardy was a great labor activist who was, had already been dead for 20 years by that point, who he was talking about. We know who Samuel Butler is, this writer of you know, utopian novels, and, and, and this other fellow, Desmond McCarthy, was an editor of that. But it's interesting, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting we know exactly what he was listening to. It's a great accuracy at the times when he was recording it, in journals and in diaries especially. And another piece of evidence from the archive of the very detailed particulars of McLuhan's media practice are these lists of expenses. And I certainly encourage you to go up, and, as some people are starting to do, and, and go take a look and, 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 uh, at, at the nearest screen. Um, and this one starts, the, the first thing it says is flick. And that means he went to a movie and it cost one, uh, it's, it's all in, I guess, shillings and pence here. Uh, so flick. And we don't know what that was, because he doesn't say, but then he says to see George Arliss uh, as The Last Gentleman. We know what that was. And that was his movie from, uh, from, from, from 1935. And then he says to keep to see Mrs. Wiggs at the Cabbage Patch down here, and we know what that was. That was this uh, W. C. Fields movie uh, from the same year. And then he also has various books. He's, he's, he's you know Dream of John Ball is a is a book by William Morris, uh, and so on. So we really know exactly uh, what he's doing. Here's another reference. It just says Mickey Mouse Bill at the Cosmopolitan. That's the the, the movie theater, and, and we know what he paid for it. We don't know what that was at least not from this source alone. Uh, flick, movie, that knocked down that. Okay, we know what that was, because that came out that year. So one could actually go and reconstruct with great exactitude exactly which movies Marshall was looking at, and which radio he was listening to, and so on, uh, at a given time. And I think it's terribly important, and in, for the following reason. I'm kind of a McLuhan skeptic in many ways, and one of the things I felt about his theories was that they weren't necessarily as well researched as they should be, and you know, it's, it, they, they're a little bit, you know, a book like Understanding Media is almost biting off more than you can chew. I mean, how could you possibly know really about all those media come on? I mean, I knew it was, it was a very important synthesis and a brilliantly useful book, but I also thought, well, you know, how, how well researched can these be? But when you think about it, we all have deep experience with all kinds of media throughout our lives. And I think it was his life experience that really gave McLuhan that kind of expertise in combination with the fact that he was paying attention. He was, as he used to say, the fish that was paying attention to the water. So, and in looking at these details, I've come to think, well, sure, you know, of course he knew what a movie was. Another example. And it was sometimes we know what he think. He knew that the Viva Villa, this movie about the Mexican Revolution, was a stirring picture ex excellently produced, and so on. I mean, there's tons of this evidence. And then, of course, I show this, this view of his office just because it has a TV in it, and I don't need to remind you of the fact that he commented a lot on, on, on TV and, uh, and then how it supplanted them. There's something funny about all these headers. I, I think we're just seeing very partial views. Maybe it's just the font that's going funny. This is called, and this next section is called being a character. As I say, these are kind of thematic and kind of chronological. And what I'm interested in, in this little section, is really talking about McLuhan's interest in rhetoric. And not least in the performative aspects of the rhetor. Of which his mother was one. 
And as you may know, Elsie McLuhan was a, what was called an elocutionist, or as we see here, a reader and impersonator, which in the pre-cinema age was a way you got your kicks, was going out and seeing these kind of vaudeville type shows or of various types. That would sometimes consist of people getting up on a stage and giving recitations, original or, or else, uh, you know, straight out of adaptations or recitations of, of, uh, of anything, really, high and low. And that's what she, that's what his mother, the very mother to whom he was writing with such alacrity about whatever latest movie he'd seen, that's what she did, did for a living back in Canada. And there's her picture, and the detail of that same photo that had the TV in it. And she's very, very uh, important to Marshall, much more so than, than, than his father. And now I'm going to show you a document from 1933, which is the brochure that is the commemoration of the graduation, Marshall's graduation in 1933 from his MA at uh, the University of Manitoba. And what's interesting is that, of course, they have valedictory addresses and so on. And what's interesting is how McLuhan makes these notes. So I guess this was Professor H.N. Fieldhouse who talked about cheese. And, 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 and this other, I'm not sure which one of these, whether it was John Thompson or Thelma Wright, who showed the advantages of Miss Mitchell's training. Maybe this is someone who was training kids in, 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 in rhetoric. And then on the back, he doesn't, he doesn't stop. He, he then goes, and on the back, the whole thing is covered. And he just goes on and on in great detail in his sort of assessment of these performances of them. Of rather catty. Uh, you know, black spoke in puerile polysyllables of the Osbornean variety, sons of the Osbornean curiosity or something. Uh, he, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So he really goes into great detail in these analysis of people's rhetorical skills. And here he is again the next year. Now we're in, uh, we're in Cambridge. In the, uh, this is the fall term of 34 when he started at, at the University of Cambridge in England. And sure enough, he's going to debates and, and, and annotating heavily. So Mr. Alport was business-like, monotone, having written on the back. Mr. I.M.C. Brady was frightfully confident, sing-song enunciation marked by levity. Mr. A. Duff Cooper was fire, you know, etc. So he was very, quite deep into this aspect of orality, uh, the performative aspect of, of uh, public speaking. And now what I'm showing you is uh, a book called The Character Anthology, and one of the unpublished books, one of the quite a few unpublished big studies that he, that he assembled in the 1940s, so this is before, as he, you know, he eventually started working on the mechanical variety in the late 40s. But there's all these books that are unpublished. There's one called Preface to Proof Rock, which is on T.S. Eliot, which I believe his son Eric is now interested in getting published. Uh, there's this other one called The Character Anthology. And The Character Anthology, is this microphone? Yeah. It's good. It's good. Good. Okay. The Character Anthology, <laughs> what's well, complicated, there was a, a 17th century. Early, in the early 17th century, throughout much of Europe, it was common to have these books of characters that were based on this ancient writer in the tradition of this ancient writer named Theophrastus. Anyway, so here he is. He's doing this kind of retro thing, 17th century thing in the 1930s, and he thought wouldn't it be instructive and amusing to have, in this case, the, as far as I can tell, the, the, the characters are actually these writers, and really what he's trying to do, I think, is give a sense of particular writing styles through making them into these characters. But that's what you remember, his mother did that. That's what she did. She was, she was a character. I can't remember how they phrased it, but she did characters. Okay, again, with apologies for the words that are spilling off the page. You're not supposed to do that in any of these. Oh, rather, I don't have to guess what I'm saying. Research and publishing uh, is next. So now we get to the real publications. Uh, including the book that eventually became the 
uh, mechanical bride. But first, there's this thing called the New American Vortex, which was really on contemporary modernist American writers. And then this thing, these are, these are um, little note cards for a book called The Guide to Chaos, for, for the, in preparation for uh, one of the books that he called The Guide to Chaos. And I'll tell you what that is in a second, but I want to show you that there are also these scrapbook pages, or some portions of scrapbook pages, that are really the raw materials for this guide. And what it is, is the book that went after one other name change became The Mechanical Bride. And so, as we get into the later notes, it's MB or Mech Bride in the notes, and there's rings of them. I mean, just, it goes on and on. And we have manuscripts, in this case, for an introduction to The Mechanical Bride, and we have typescripts. And then among, among all these files, we sometimes have even the original files that he had. These, if there was something with some writing on it, like this one called Beautiful Bodies, which was one of his exhibits, he called them. One of his specimens for analysis, basically of, of the, uh, usually it was just a single advertisement, as one reason what the book became in the end. Uh, and this one was called Beautiful Bodies. I think it made it into the book. It's hard to, to keep track after seeing of all, all these, because there's, there's hundreds, I think, and many of them didn't even make it into the 50 that actually became the Mechanical Bride. And this Beautiful Bodies was about a, a kind of pinup advertisement for a funeral home, which greatly amused him. And so he thought I got to write about this. Uh, and why is that not going forward? Uh, here's another one. This one is originally called Hygiene, and, and then we had, had the snappier title, How Not to Offend, and that's all about the various hygiene projects like um, deodorants uh, or, or um, toothpaste or mouthwash. Uh, and, and here, too, what we have is all of the clippings. You know, in the, in the eventual book that is The Mechanical Bride, all we have is one image. And his son, Eric, tells me that the images in that book were actually made from slides, and that the mechanical bride in the 1940s started out as a kind of traveling slide lecture, which is very interesting. And uh, so they were actually quite faded and beat up by the time they became these uh, rather grungy uh, you know, illustrations for the mechanical bride. But we have a lot of the original material from which the slide was taken, and much, much more. Uh, here. here you can see multiple copies of the, of the Lil Abner, which is one that did make it into the final book. Uh, one of the so-called exhibits in The Mechanical Bride. It was this idea of the exhibits, which we'll also see pop up later on in his work, it came from a book, uh, it came chiefly from a book by his hero and sometime pen pal, Wyndon Lewis, who uh, wrote a book called The Doom of Youth, and, and which in the back had a bunch of, at this section, uh, an appendix, that consisted of uh, transcriptions of newspaper clippings. And that was all textual, but McLuhan sort of did it in a different way. I was looking at text and image together uh, in the mechanical bride. Rick Bradford was talking about that exact comic, and, and here's some other stuff in the same file. Flash Gordon, Rick Bradford was a kind of Flash Gordon spaceman type. And we even have, this isn't the very image that appears as, as front page, but he certainly did have, you know, you would collect things like the front page of the New York Times and look at it, as he would say, like a work of art. And here we have the manuscript and the typescript for that opening section of The Mechanical Bride, which I think there's a, a copy of is being passed around, the recent uh, re-edition of that. I invite you to look at that. And now this is very important. Because what we, it doesn't look like much, I know. But it's very, very important. Because what we have now at the top of the page and the bottom of the page are different versions of the little call-outs, the little um, kind of captions that appear in The Mechanical Bride. And the way it works is you have the image, you have the actual little essay proper, and then you have these kind of punchy questions. And in the original, See if we can get closer here. Yeah, okay, so the original, which I can barely make out on the front page, it started out with these very dry and academic 
uh, rephrased questions, such as, what is the effect of the mind of the presentation of a large number of unrelated news stories? Et is unconnectedness necessary to objective reporting? Is it possible to achieve at once a local and international panorama by any other means? And so on. And then at the bottom, what you have in manuscript is what ended up in the book and what he does. And now he says, what's the score here? Why is a page of news a problem in orchestration? How does the jazzy ragtime discontinuity of press items link up with other modern art forms? And you can see what he's done is in jazzing up his language. What he started to do is emulate the very language of the ad men that he is uh, studying. So it becomes very meta as a, as a piece of writing and much more entertaining. And now what I'm showing you are actually the, uh, you'll see 12, 14, you know, bold. This is, a, these, these are actually some pages that are the instructions to the, uh, to the makers of the book. So, so, so these are actually the publishers. I guess Aaron Savaiko was the designer. Uh, and this was published by Vanguard Press in 1951. And, and there it is. And something to know about the mechanical body, in case you don't already know it, is that McLuhan hated it. It just took him like five or six years to really find a publisher and get it through uh, publication. You can see him complaining to, especially to Ezra Pound and to Wyndham Lewis and letters saying, you know, after it's come out, you think there'd be like a relief. He's like, ugh, this awful thing. He says, it's, it's so compromised. It's so normalized. And he really wanted to have something that was much more hybrid, much more polymorphous, much more fun, much more probably spontaneous. And so he really wasn't happy uh, with the whole process of the production of this book. And there's the front page, that's what I'm talking about, the front page, and then these are these columns. What's the score here? So that was another example. Now, a publication that did make him happy was Counterblast. And Counterblast was a book that came out in 1954. And the story behind this is that his Buddy Ted Carpenter, the anthropologist, brought to his attention something that is generally called the Massey Report, which was a federal document that was basically summing up the state of Canadian culture and saying what we need to do about it. And Marshall McLuhan thought this was just like the most hilarious thing he ever read. Uh, and he immediately set to work in writing a kind of parodic uh, commentary on the Massey Report, which is this thing called Counterblast, which is in the style very much of Blast by Wyndham Lewis, right, which you, which you may be familiar with. It's pink instead of blue, so it's even kind of playing in there. And as you can see, there's a lot of sort of futuristic typographic play, a la Marinetti, Parole di Libertà. Another publication project of the 50s that was really very dear to Marshall and he had more control over, and that was, I suppose, typical, typically satisfying that it was collaborative, which is something that we'll see more and more of too as we, as we survey his literacy, uh, was this um, series called Explorations. And these are the five copies, different ones that I happen to own. As seen on my uh, dining room table. And that'll give you a sense, really, of the ambition of these books that were made in the wake of this Ford Foundation grant that he had in 1953. So, a grant from the American government to, for this outfit in Toronto, him and various clever interdisciplinary team of Ted Carpenter and Jacqueline Turwitt and Tom Easterbrook and others to uh, reflect on communications and culture. And this was their sort of house organ, this uh, look. And there's, there, there, here, here's one that's ripping on the New York Times. 
This is from 1958 or something, but it's a fake headline from 1963 talking about how Life magazine is, is, uh, is no more because it's been killed on TV. It also had these very scientific uh, sections, in this case a very famous uh, graph showing the, uh, this is from an experiment from the late 50s that this, that this team did, uh, I think it might have been after 59, when he got some, some money from the, uh, again, from the American government, to the media, and, and what they were, even though he's in Canada, right, at this point. Uh, and, and this is showing the comparative, um, it's really a study in attention and comprehension based on various students at Ryerson University who were reading or hearing or somehow taking in the same information by different media. And, and, and their comprehension levels were very different depending, depending on what they saw on TV or saw, you know, had it recited to them or read it and so on. But it's also just sort of luscious. Uh, and here's a section with, you know, funny little half pages that are in, printed in silver coloring. Uh, there's a, a dummy book that for, for the 1960 uh, anthology explorations of communication. And that brings us to the 60s and to the 1962 book, uh, The Gutenberg Galaxy, which is beautifully produced by the uh, University of Toronto Press. There's a re-edition of this year, but you know, they kind of got it right the first time, really, uh, as, a, as a work of typography. And if you look closely at this, you'll really see how very radical a book it is. Okay, we've got the big call-outs. Well, that's, we remember those from, from the last publication. But what's really amazing about this is it's all this slightly smaller font here are quotations. These are just big chunks of quotation. You know, here's someone who's happy to just kind of have this mashup of other people's writings and, and, and call it a book. I mean, that's, a not, that's not an adequate description of what it is, but it is a uh, description of what goes on in a lot of this book. And it's certainly not, you know, in line with academic norms either then or now. And, and here are the type of typographers' instructions for, for these same columns, and I'm not going to belabor those, but I'm just going to show you very glancingly that there's lots of this evidence for this very beautiful book. And look at that logo that they've got made for this as well. It's really great design, great, great design. Uh, from 1962. Now the next book, which is Understanding Media, began life as a very important offshoot of this money we got in 19, 1959 to do the project in Understanding New Media. And these are some bits of this. Uh, what we have here is, this is actually the student survey to which I was referring. Here it is tabulated. There it is in the original archival form of the, of the, of the graph that, that, that got reprinted in Explorations. So look, someone read a mini-graph, someone read, I guess, in some other kind of print, television lecture, and their comprehension levels are different. There's lots of, of evidence for this, uh, this study, this very important study in 1959 that was basically, no one's really looked at it archivally. And here is the uncorrected proof of the report on understanding new media. So this is the book, the kind of initial version of understanding media, which had, had a fairly different form. Uh, and so there we go. There's his bound copy. And as you can see, it does just what understanding media does. It's a 1960 book that takes each medium and discusses it separately, in this case, in kind of drier prose. Same thing that happened. In, uh, in, in Mechanical Bride, he eventually kind of jazzes it up for the, for, for the final version. It has exhibits, we know about those. Basically, just these appendices. Here's one of the appendices, exhibit two. And what it is is a transcript of a 1960 television uh, program that, he did, that Marshall helped put together with TV, CB, for CBC and, of course, starred in Marshall McLuhan being Marshall McLuhan. And already, I mean, very much being Marshall McLuhan already in 19, 1960. 
So it was a cover to my uh, copy of Understanding Media, the 64 book, but there's the, uh, the jazzier title letters. There's the, there's the paperback version. 1967 was the year of the great book, The Medium is the Massage. And I don't need to go into the history of that or the other book produced by Jerome Agel and Quentin Fury, along with McLuhan, because this week is coming out a brand new book on the subject by Jeffrey Schnapp, which is incredible. And I think it's one of the best things published on McLuhan uh, you know, in, in recent years. And it's very interesting, and it's, a, it's really about uh, this impresario, this new kind of publisher, Jer Jerome Agel is how I know, now know he pronounced his name, uh, A-G-E-L, and he got to, he put together Marshall McLuhan and the designer Quentin Fuhr to make the medium of the massage, but also many, many other books some of which were bombs, some of which were successes, and the masterpiece is actually a book on Buckminster Fuller uh, called I Seem to Be a Verb, and it's incredible. It's an amazing book, and still, you know, very much, you know, you can buy it, I mean, used, and I would recommend it. Uh, and uh, also Carl Sagan and others, so, so, so that medium is massage was really part of a series featuring various kind of intellectuals. It also came out, as many of you may know, in LP form, and also, as you may or may not know, it came out as Aspen 4, which is the magazine in a box. And issue 4 of Aspen was designed, was the medium was the massage, and it was designed by Quentin Fury, and it was really all the text. And no doubt, many of the ideas for, for the design as well came from Marshall McLuhan. And it's this kind of grab bag, here's a poster, here's uh, various little booklets and things that it consists of, beautifully, lavishly produced. I'm sorry I don't have time to dwell on any of this, but really what I'm trying to do is just saturate you with a sense of the totality of this and, and the kind of feel of it, the texture of it. 69, McLuhan had the means to produce a much fancier version of uh, Counterblast. So that's the book Counterblast, the one that, that up until this year was the only really fully published version as opposed to this mimeograph that he sent out. And now for something really unknown, I think, and, and really quite special which are these publications, series of publications called the Dew Line Reports. And you know about, including the Dew Line, the idea of the distant early warning system, and how you know, Canadian culture is a kind of Dew Line because we can kind of see American culture coming just like we didn't see the American, you know, the missiles coming from Russia anyway. And this is another one of these fellows uh, like Mr. Agel, there was a fellow named Schwartz, you know, Gene Schwartz, who was a New York ad man, one of these Madison Avenue mad men, who was, who really kind of looked up McLuhan. And he was very, very big, as you know, in advertising circles in the 60s. There was also Howard Gossage in, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. And there were all, a lot of these kind of impresarios, these very, you know, forward thinking people in a very, very forward-thinking and very hip uh, business of advertising. This guy, Eugene Schwartz, said, why don't we do this uh, series of little publications called the Dewline Reports? And they take many forms. So here in 1968 is the first one. I'm not, I don't really want, again, don't have time to belabor the content. I just want to flash through. And here the hand is helpful, right? Because you can see that one's very small. I just want to flash through a bunch of these to show you the variety of forms that they took. Here's a poster popping up, just like so. It's almost like a poor man's version of the uh, Aspen 4. It's very hard to see here, but there's, there's actually, you can 
this is kind of translucent, semi-translucent paper that shows the title. Here's one, uh, a do line report from Howard in 1969 that looks like a newspaper. And it has an ad for the do line reporting. And we're going to see a lot of this stuff coming up, this kind of folding in and self-referencing, and, and uh, it gets very messy in, 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 in productive ways in the late 60s. Here's another one with a sort of Lichtenstein-esque bang. This detail here is a little metaphor of McLuhan's about the satellite being a proscenium arch around the globe. Here's sort of explanations, visual, verbal, uh, expositions on information overload and pattern recognition, which of course are very dear to McLuhan in, in navigating the media maelstrom. Here we have these Joycean and uh, quotations and really, really fancy graphics. Sort of Richard Riley type thing going on there. Here's the back of it. So you can see and then you'll, you'll get to something very dry. You'll get to things that just look very sort of scientific and, 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 uh, and serious and not so punchy. There's the, the same charts that we saw in another form earlier. And sometimes you get three, three for one in your uh, do line report. And this is very typical. This, uh, I'll do that again. This sort of uh, cutting the page reversal of the narrative order from you know front to back or just plain mixed up or on loose sheets that you could reorganize yourself and there's a lot of these kind of aleatory uh, and, and, and uh, you know just very playful practices going on you know, lots of little windows and things this looks I don't know what this looks like I mean I mean you know some kind of scientific thing I guess And here, you know, we have another kind of book. And here's an advertisement for the upcom an upcoming edition, which will have the Dueline card deck, which we'll see momentarily. It's a contemporary I Ching. And I'll explain it in a minute. And there is some posters. This one looks like a tax form. You have to see the original because it's, it's in this kind of uh, newsprint and it feels like a US tax form. It's playing on John Milton and Spiro Agnew in the title. I can't go into it. But you can see there the layout of it. And this is the most unprepossessing one, at least on the title page. It's this horrible mimeograph, which I guess is the sort of, maybe that's it. You know, I, I think this is actually the original and it's deliberately looking sort of grungy and low tech. And what it is, is a 1970 interview between Gary Kern and Marshall McLuhan. And now, look what happens. Question, answer. Question, answer. Question, answer. Question, answer. And so on. So pretty fancy after all, isn't it? I mean, this looks to me like a kind of 50s thing. So now they're getting kind of retro with their little depiction of skyscrapers in this. The page within the page, which is not unheard of in advertising, but here there's the levels of self-consciousness and kind of self-referencing, I think, that, are, that go beyond even what advertising is capable of. And here are the instructions of the distant early warning card deck, which this is this thing that they were calling the I Ching for the uh, modern manager. And it was just that. It, was, it had these rules, but also a kind of randomness to it. And what you were supposed to do is you had this deck of cards that got mailed out to you with that edition of the, of the uh, do line. And you made decisions on the basis of these funny cards, which were the precursor to Brian Eno's uh, public strategies. The missing link between I Ching and the, the oblique strategies. And McLuhan, I show you these notes just as one indication that McLuhan was very seriously involved in the production of most, if not all, of the Dewline 
uh, thing. So this is a, these are serious publications that he was really writing, he was really involved in, he was really making, and, you know, it's hard to even, I've never even seen an image of one until these photos I took. And we even have a mock-up here for one of these, you will recall which one probably, so you can really get a kind of fingertip feel for how things were published in the pre-digital age, probably offset lithography, ultimately, but before that, these kind of paste downs. Okay, <coughs> so the next section I'm going to call, oh, and this actually worked, it didn't go off the page, but in, in uh, homage to Antonioni, I'm going to call it blow up, and I'm going to take you again even faster now through some images of McLuhan kind of getting big in the media. Uh, this is from 1955, and it's just he gave a lecture at uh, the Columbia, the Teachers College of uh, University of, uh, of Columbia University in New York, and he appeared on the cover of that. And it's got a little mimeograph lecture from him. And as I say, he, you know, I don't have time to go into the role of mimeographs in uh, in, in McLuhan's work, but. It's important, you know, the, the, the range of the kind of publication uh, that, you know, different types of publication that he had. Now we're in 1959, in the Varsity Review in 1962, so I'm showing the images at the top, and I don't really have time to get into, well, sometimes you can see exactly what the publication is Saturday night. Uh, 1963, he wins a top literary award. This is when he won the Governor General's Award. Uh, 64, and again, I'm not even going to comment much on these, okay, here's a, you know, McLuhan said that John Diefenbaker, the Prime Minister, should, you know, be more cool and more like the Beatles, so now you have an image of John Diefenbaker and the Beatles, wig, but of mop top. Uh, so he already is this kind of you know, already by 64, he's now becoming this kind of witty uh, pundit who gets picked up everywhere. New Yorker, 1965, says, for instance, he, McLuhan, has compared the bomb to the doctoral dissertation, discussed the depth-involving qualities of sunglasses, textured stockings, discotheques, and comic books, reported on the iconic properties of Andy Warhol's signed suit cans, which he saw in the great exhibition in Toronto in 64, and predicted a happy day when everyone will have his own portable computer to cope with the dreary business of digesting information. Silly, uh, silly idea. Uh, now he's on TV. This is in McLean's, the high, the high priest of pop culture. Prophet of the age of instant knowledge. Canada's intellectual comment in Harper's Magazine in the States, and of course the obligatory cute cartoons of which this is one of the more charming ones. Now the French, meaning the, the French Canadian media, pick up La Comet Intellectuelle du Canada. Here he is in Life Magazine, his whole family. There he is looking very jaunty, and they comment on this sort of, uh, on, on, on how he sets his hat now. I think he's actually trying to look like uh, John Steed in, in that one, if you get that reference. Looks a bit like Clockwork Orange in a later reworking of that photograph. But you can see he, he's kind of blowing up now. So back to 66. Dick Higgins, so now we're with Fluxus. Madison Avenue magazine, big feature on him, no surprise. Here's with his whole family in the women's section of the Toronto Telegram. He's puzzling people now. There's his former student, Hugh Kenner, in, in this conservative rag talking about McLuhan. Here are some notes from KQED, the terrific uh, radio uh, TV station in, uh, in San Francisco that, are, that included the interview of McLuhan in 66. There he is on Canadian TV, and the sort of TV guy, basically. Here's an invitation to, to Marshall from something else, which is Fluxus Dick Higgins again, to a, to a McLuhan happening, which is taking place, and there's a little ad for it, from probably the Village Voice or something. 
1966. Now this is an important image, which some of you may know, which is McLuhan relaxing in this kind of piece of lawn furniture that he had in his office. And, you know, famously with this huge picture of Allen Ginsberg, that I think was given to him by, by Allen Ginsberg. And the, with the caption underneath, it says, this is in the Toronto Daily Star, Marshall McLuhan in his foxhole office at St. Michael's College, complete with 40 cup coffee urn, which is not just for display, 1936 Cambridge rowing oar, Ginsberg photograph, and accumulation of reading matter that gives his quarters the appearance of an overstocked used bookstore. You know, this is not your typical photograph of an academic from, from 19, uh, 1967. And uh, you know, he's very much the hipster. He's very much playing to the camera. He claims to have really not liked this photograph to be circulated, but you know, I mean, he let it happen, right? Uh, and so I think it, there's a, that he certainly knows uh, what he's doing here. And here's more of this kind of meta element, this folding in. At the corner of that same uh, newspaper page, at the bottom corner of which it's, where it's, the McLuhan photo is at the top with Ginsburg, we have this <laughs> reproduction of the cover of Explorations 5, and it says at the bottom, McLuhan's magazine. The magazine cover showed a star page because in front of this, you know, ancient goddess. If you look carefully, there's the Toronto Star. And now the Toronto, in the Toronto, the Toronto Star is commenting on. You know, it's almost too much to think about at this hour. Or why Marshall McLuhan matters to you. New York Times. Again, something else quite obligatory is is these synopses of the history of technology. Uh, there's a visualization of his famous hot, cool uh, comparison of why JFK works in the media and, uh, and Nixon doesn't. Here he is in the cover of Newsweek, and you'll see that he's surrounded by Marshall McLuhan. So it's a sort of John Malkovich kind of McLuhan, McLuhan, McLuhan. McLuhan, McLuhan, McLuhan inside, too. It'd be, it'd, it'd be just, so it's crazy, constant collage, you know, McLuhan themed collages all over the place. Again, more cartoons, etc. So there's this is from an architecture magazine. They're just you know no one can resist, uh, and I, I can't either, as you can see. Okay, there is an art et lettres, une bombe philosophique venue du Canada. Now we're in France. We're talking about it, and this is this very pulpy publication, which is which is fun. <laughs> which cracks me up, but also because it reproduces, it replays these images out of the Life magazine feature from, you know, the year before or whatever. Joker or genius or both, so we, of course we get all these speculations about whether he's for real. You know, here in the New York Times, we have now uh, there's a story with a photograph about the release of Medium as the Massage that shows this kind of promotional campaign where they had these women in miniskirts which are very dear to Marshall, uh, parading around with signs showing the LP version of the medium is massage. It's getting complicated. Here, as one of the sort of, you know, typical things typifying the Choc de Soissant in L'Express in, 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 in France, we have an image from the, from the medium is the massage, the scandale de Clouin. Germany. Zagreb. France again, so now in 69. And here we have an image embedded in that magazine of the French version of the voice prints, uh, which is one of the uh, things that appears in uh, Medium's Massage, and it's, it says you, 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 or vu, vu, vu. Although I noticed in the German translation, which came out this year, it says you, 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 but then it has this German text in the small. So it keeps going, you know, it keeps proliferating in, in, in very complicated ways. And now as an epilogue, oh boy, and see these things are all off the screen again. So as opposed to saying free wheel and Marshall McLuhan, what I want to do is just play some video clips. Uh, and the title is an homage to, to Bob Dylan, the free wheel and Bob Dylan. And I want to put 
McLuhan together. And in a way, this is a gathering of some of the things I've been looking at, some of the uh, explanations of his persona, which we're now going to see a little closer up in video form. And I want to put it together with various other people, performers, who, all of the other ones American, who epitomized freedom in this era uh, of the early 60s. So there's Arnett Coleman, who made, uh, of course, the album Free Jazz in 1960, and that was instead of having just, you know, individual, lots of little tracks in an LP, it was an LP that was just one 40-minute track with his two-part quartet, it was an octet that he called the two-part quartet, and, and of course it was very free harmonically in, in other ways as well. Lenny Bruce, who was a comedian who epitomized freedom, not just because of the First Amendment stuff, that he was swearing a lot and dragged off to jail, but also because he really loosened up the whole uh, presentation style of, can, of stand up and become much less can and much more improvisatory and free form, and Bob Dylan. Okay, so let's, and in all, the, in all of these clips I'm going to show you, I want you to really pay attention to the sort of, sort of formally, the sound might not be that good, it doesn't matter that much in most cases what they're saying. Uh, I, I, I just want you to see, just, well, to see for yourself what he looks like um, on TV. Work best on television, whether it's Pat or the or the, you know, the, the bar show. Are ones you know, which admit of a great deal of casualness in which people can be uh, introduced and dialogued with in the presence of the camera at all sorts of levels of their lives. You capture them at all sorts of strange and, and uh, offbeat moments of their existence. And this kind of probing and peeling off the superficial aspects of people and so on is normal to this medium. It, it is a deaf medium. So already very meta, there you see what he's commenting on is how TV lends itself to a certain kind of casualness, and, and he's pretty good, you know, at, at sort of getting up there and the being casual, the sorry, that that was bad to have stop. And I just want to contrast that, now I want to go straight into, is this working? Yeah. Now I want to go straight into Bob Dylan with a very McLuhan-esque uh, Dylan quote, uh, sort of section. Now this is, sorry. This is from, uh, it, it's a Negan Hit. It's a clip from the 1967 movie, Don't Look Back, but it's filmed by the Pennebachers in the spring of two years earlier, 65. And there's a Time Magazine reporter who's the guy who we saw in the first uh, shot, and uh, he's being harangued by this cocky young singer, Bob Dylan. Uh, without even opening his mouth, he's basically being set straight uh, by Dylan about, it's a little, as I say, McLuhan-esque riff, but let me see if I can go back to the beginning. Good. Okay. And the apologies. You hear it, see it, and uh, it's going to happen fast, and you're not going to get it all, and you might even hear the wrong words, you know. And then afterwards, I can't, I won't be able to talk to you afterwards, I got nothing to say about these things I write. I mean, I just write them. I'm not going to say anything about it, I don't write for any reason. There's no great message. Okay. So ignore the content. Just, you know, get with it. And now here's, now I'm going to flip to McLuhan. Uh, I believe in, in 67 or thereabouts. Uh, talking about his attitude to his own publications. And basically he's talking about he doesn't pay much attention to them after the fact. If I were to trust the observations of my critics, I would uh, despond uh, and uh, despair to the point of cutting my throat. However, I find a certain amount of pleasure uh, in uh, such activities as I engage in, and uh, it is mainly in the process of making discoveries that I find my satisfactions. I find no satisfactions whatever in reading about them, or I, I can't bear to reread anything I have ever written, or I couldn't bear to read here anything I've ever said. That is, I might have to bear it, but it wouldn't be fun. Okay, see, so you see what's going on here. Dylan is saying, 
It's going to happen fast. You're going to miss it. There's going to be too much going on. You're not going to be able to take it in. And tough. And McLuhan's saying, yeah, I write this, you know, and, and, and really one of the things McLuhan, uh, Dylan is saying is, you know, I'm not playing by the rules, and I'm not just, you know, put on this earth for your sort of, so you can analyze me and kind of put me in a box or whatever. Uh, I'm just sort of doing my thing, and you can kind of take it or leave it. McLuhan is effectively saying the same, same as publications. You want to criticize me? He says, too late. You know, I'm, I've moved on. I've already, I don't even read my stuff. You read my stuff? Oh, whatever. You know, it doesn't, so, and it's a, and it's a certain style, I think, uh, and a certain kind of freedom that is coming very much into vogue. And really, I think the kind of apotheosis, to my mind, of McLuhan, is in this, uh, this 1967 clip from, uh, from, from CBC. And I'll play it first, and then I'll tell you why I think it's so great. And I'll tell you in advance to really look at the camera techniques, and just look at the cutting, and the zooming, uh, and the close-ups, and how different it is from CBC just seven years earlier in the audience. What do you think Marshall uh, McLuhan ought to do if he wants to be taken more seriously in the world today? Marshall McLuhan is taken far too seriously. I certainly wouldn't do anything to increase that. Marshall McLuhan, you say TV has turned the world into a global village. Am I right? Well, turn us on into global village idiots. Again, uh, not, there are worse things. Um, an idiot means a very private person. Yes, and that's a Greek word, meaning a very private person. I'm losing my idiot status steadily. I'm becoming less and less private. I'd much rather be an idiot. You've been quoted as saying that you don't necessarily agree with everything that you say. I have no point of view. And as for example, no. See, I, I, I couldn't possibly have a point of view. I'm just moving around and picking up information from many directions. No, uh, a point of view it means a static fixed position, and you can't have a static fixed position in the electric age. It's impossible to have a point of view in the electric age and have any meaning at all. You've got to be everywhere at once, whether you like it or not. You have to be participating in everything going on at the same time, and that is not a point of view. And what's so incredible about this to me in this moment, you know, of 67, is really how so much of society has almost caught up with McLuhan. And you can see this whole thing staged in a way where he's swiveling around without a point of view, which lends itself to like to almost physical comedy or, or you know, uh, this 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 kind of uh, you know free form uh, where he doesn't even have to sit still. Uh, you can see that the lights in the background, the one could say gratuitous light show that was that was in behind him uh you know there too we don't, we don't need to reiterate uh uh McLuhan's, you know light bulb light light bulb is information uh but you can really see as i say it's all come together i mean i mean even you know cbc is, is very quickly caught up uh with uh with just what McLuhan, just with just where McLuhan said we were going Um, almost done. I'm just going to go back to Explorations 5 just because I, I want to uh, give you a sense of that publication and this is a good time to do it. Because what this is, is a funny little, um, Explorations is very interesting and it's this collage of often unsigned chunks of text. And so we don't even know who wrote this. And it's, this is the whole thing, this is the whole section. What, chopped it up, that, because it's on one page and the next page. And somebody is saying, I have been reading a book on East and West in religion by Radha Krishnan, and am and, and, and impressed at the starting point, which is implied in Radha Krishnan's use of words. For example, he will say, logic tends to reduce everything to identity, but there is nothing that remains for two successive moments of its existence. Uh, don't worry, you know this is, doesn't make sense. 
Our philosophers, however, do not think of themselves as reducing the non-identical to identity. They start with the validity, logical necessity of self-identity. Okay, now, now this is the good part. This incidentally reminds me of a story Lyman Bryson told me. It's really weird because we don't even know who me is. But anyway, that's... When Warren Weaver was in India two years ago, he attended a court session where a village woman was giving testimony. The judge told her, your testimony is false. Last week you gave a different story. And the woman replied, this week I'm a different person. If I'd given you the same testimony, then it would have been false. So we can see already in, in the 50s, Thank you, bye. Bye. this fluidity of identity, this, this uh, refusal to be pinned down to a stable and single self found in other cultures, and as sort of the world gets into this kind of secondary reality, this tribal phase, everybody's doing it, and on the front guard of that are, uh, are Dylan and McLuhan. And here's Lenny Bruce, and this is, uh, I'll just a couple more, because almost done. This is Lenny Bruce, and again, this is like Don't Look Back, this is a film of 67, this shows a performance of 65, uh, Lenny near the end of his life, and he's talking about how he gets criticized, not for his performances per se, but for an understanding based on a very mediated version of his performance that is beside the point, because like they weren't there. You'll see what I mean, I hope. I just want you to see him in action too and see this kind of style. Yeah. And I figured out after four years why I got arrested so many times. Think what happened. It's been a comedy of error. Here's how it happens. I do my act at perhaps uh, 11 o'clock at night. Little do I know that 11 a.m. next morning, before the grand jury somewhere, is another guy doing my act who's introduced Lenny Bruce in substance. Here he is, Lenny Bruce in substance. A peace officer who is trained for to recognize clear and present danger, not make believe. But the act, the grand jury watches him work, and they go, that stinks. <laughs> but I get busted. And the irony is that I have to go to court and defend his act. Because <laughs> he's going to defend the complaint. I'm going to show you two more clips. Let's just close out with, with another one, another clip from uh, Don't Look Back, which is much more loose and really just shows uh, <laughs> And again, look at the cutting. You might not be able to even hear the sound or interpret it, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is just how kind of free things get very quickly. Uh, I need your precedence, I suppose, in Cassavetes or whatever, but really quickly in, in, in by 67, in this, and then I'm going to show a closer with a McLuhan clip. But here we go, another very brief clip from uh, the Pennebacher film, Don't Look Back, about Bob Dylan's 65 tour. <laughs> He's coming out of the concert here in London. The Vanishing American. The Vanishing American. It's the same, right? You have that on the phone. I mean, it's something special. I'm excited to call you a anarchist. That's the word now. So we saw Dylan saying earlier that there's no message. Now it's like you're an anarchist. People are saying because you offer no solution. You know, these are the people who bemoan the fact that he had gone from being a very meaningful protest singer to being something else. And now finally I'm going to close with something that just came onto the web for the first time, the whole film by McLuhan. It's been one of the many little holy grails, uh, at least in my experience of McLuhan studies, is, is a movie that I knew he made called Picnic in Space, which is made featuring him and Harley Parker is the designer of, among other things, Counterblast 69, 
who was an exhibit designer, head of exhibition design at the Royal Ontario Museum in, uh, in Toronto. And it consists, this film, it's, very, it's a very messed up narrative that half of which is McLuhan and Harley Parker kind of just hanging out in a field thinking about space. And then it's more complicated than that, much more complicated. And parts of it, which I suspect were designed by Harley Parker, or at least had some influence in it, and you'll see some, some, of, some of both, the loose stuff, and you'll see the other stuff, look more like an Eames film, like, you know, Powers of Ten by Charles Murray Eames. And you'll see all of that and more. And the more, in this closing thing I'm going to show you, is McLuhan commenting on how film works, what film is, talking about black and white. Uh, you'll see a lot of pop references to various artists, among them Warhol and Liechtenstein and Oldenburg. Uh, and, then you'll see, and, then, and then you'll see these, uh, these two works, a uh, couple of works by um, Jasper Johns, one of them consisting of a, of a flashlight near of a light bulb, and then it ends with McLuhan holding a flashlight and a light bulb kind of out in the field where he began talking. So let's just take a look. not that. Sorry, here we go. And it's kind of corny in the way that um, medium is a massage, LP is. Sort of 
surface material, so we need to know what was pre-printed and what was kind of overprinted and how it was done. We need to understand them on the level of, uh, you know, language of this telegraphies, which is somewhere between sort of Morse code and, and um, you know, uh, and, and, and sort of today's SMS or Telex, these, you know, these kind of, these kind of short form languages. We need to understand them behind that on the level of the code. I mean, ASCII was developed in the early 60s for Telex which is why you know, the computer-based thing was to tell about. So I think that, and I think that he, but I think he knew what time it was. He knew what was going on. You can't be kind of writing understanding media and building synthesizers. Uh, you know, I mean, dealing with so many media in that level, or, or, or he couldn't anyway, and he didn't. That wasn't his thing. But I think he was very, you can see from these clipping files exactly that he knew, you know, really what was going on. Yes. Do you have any more insights into how all this stuff was collected? Like, did he just not have time to deal with things and put things away in boxes, I'll deal with it later, deal with it later, and then lived in a stable enough environment where he was able to keep everything? Or did his wife keep things? I mean, do you have any insight into just exactly the, the nature of that fetish, I suppose, as well as um, the, the, the life lived where it's possible? You know, I know at the coach house at U of T where he was, for so many years. Was that where a lot of that stuff was? It was in a family home? Those kind of insights, you know? Well, he had multiple offices. I mean, one at his house, one at St. Mike's, and then ultimately one at the coach house. So, uh, and, and that's where a lot of this stuff was in play in his lifetime. Um, and, you know, in a sense, that's, it's probably easier to just like keep stuff and throw it away, I guess. And, and so in a sense, maybe there's some deficiency there. Uh, since he had the space to kind of stow this stuff. I think what's amazing to me is for how long, how deeply involved he was in everything. Uh, I mean, it became, you know, answering his mail, he still did. I mean, he did that all the way through, which is already like mind-boggling when you consider what it must be like to be Marshall McLuhan receiving mail in 1968. Uh, so, on, on, so he actually answered those, but in this case, with the aid of his, of his secretary and, and so on, to organize things and, and sort through and open the mail and all that. But all the, you know, the do line, as I say, there's a lot of manuscript notes for him all the way through. So in the short answer to that, I would say just how impressed I am by his depth of involvement in so much of it. I mean, the guy was really a serious workaholic as well as a warrior. Uh, yes. uh, how far is it possible uh, to trace the process of assembling a book in the archive? Because uh, you have been showing uh, some parts of the mechanical bride and the various stages of assembling image and text, or maybe the same as in the case of the uh, medium's massage. I mean, do, do you really get like a storyboard of how the book was developing through different stages? Is it all there? So you could, like the making of, like the backstage? Aspect? Yeah, I, I think you could really piece it all together for certain of the books on the basis of what's there. Just, you know, I didn't even show you the, you know, sheet of paper that shows the uh, editorial coding system that was, you know, that, that, that he kept, of course, uh, for the uh, making of, um, of the Gutenberg Galaxy. But I think between just the sheer weight of what's there, which itself implies a pretty obvious chronology in most, in most cases of, of, of production, and between the fact that this isn't ancient history, so there's, we can still sort of even talk to people who, who were, you know, involved in production circa 1960, and given the fact that there's so much circumstantial evidence or, or so much, you know, surrounding evidence from other productions at the time, I think, yeah, sure, we could, like, really, in, in great depth, uh, reconstruct the, the, the makings of this. But I think the most fascinating one, for sure, uh, to me, in terms of the actual production, is the book that eventually became The Mechanical Bride. Uh, and there, too, I kind of told a highly simplified story. Actually, there are all kinds of subject files, you know, a big fat file on the Beatles and so many big fat subject files on TV and whatever that sort of continued after, you know, they continued to grow and evolve even after the production of that. And it's a quagmire, but a very, uh, you know, there, too, one could certainly uh, piece together a, a story. 
Okay, thank you very much, Karen. We're going to have to basically close down there. Um, I'd also like to thank Eric Siebert, who helped put this together, the technician, and then Batska. Maybe just as a closing question, I mean, you've presented it a whole as a cornucopia of new materials for I think, a lot of us, uh, new stuff, new insights. Um, what will you be doing with it? So how do, how do you continue this uh, this work, or how do you want to see this come in sort of what form output we have from it? And then we'll, we'll end off on that, so just a short comment where you're going with it. Well, I mean, the ultimate fantasy would, would be to get involved in a highly, you know, serious collaborative project that would digitize, you know, at least all of the kinds of really good stuff that I've been showing you uh, and tag it properly with the kind of depth that I've been suggesting and sort of going through his shopping list and finding out exactly what was what. And then that, when we'll be able to really kind of connect the dots uh, on, the, on the basis of that. So I, mean, I think the kind of deep archiving would be the most sort of serious thing to do that and how one did it. I mean, you know, there are any number of ways. If you can get, get the rights and get it out there, you can crowdsource it or, you know, whatever. I mean, there, so, so to me, and it's, and what's great about it is, is this, this kind of meta element. I mean, the fact that it is not only, uh, you know, these records of so many 20th century technologies as they, as they develop, but also as seen through the filter of this person who was, who was reflecting so, so steadily and so deeply on it. So I think that there would, there would be a kind of, of uh, perfection in a way. I mean, you know, to, it would be like a, a nice happy ending for this to be digitized and be, and be sort of mined in, in, in that kind of depth. And I think there'd be a lot of, of connections would emerge that would precisely you know, sort of, uh, to answer Gigi's question about, about how reconstructable things are, I think they're incredibly, like, mind-bogglingly reconstructable. And you know what he was doing on Thursday night of, you know, May 9th, 1935, what movie he was watching. I think, you know, if we put all that together, you could get, get pretty deep. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for giving a happy ending also to the retouching McLuhan conference that began back in, in May. And thank you to Sarah, Catalina, and, and Anya for all of you who came this evening, um, I hope that we'll have some, some more McLuhan-themed and McLuhan-focused uh, events here at the Marshall McLuhan Salon in the future, and uh, I hope that you'll also be able to come back again. And Graham, thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. Thank you all for coming.